At the end of April 1958, Vice President Richard Nixon and his wife went on an 18-day scheduled tour of Latin America. It was intended to be a goodwill tour that hoped to revive the U.S. good neighbor policy and stress shared economic interests. But the tour did not go as planned, and on May 13, 1958, the Vice President's motorcade was attacked on the streets of Caracas, Venezuela in an event that shocked the public and transformed U.S. policy towards the region for a generation. It also raised the thorny question of what almost happened. It is history that deserves to be remembered. It was 1958, and the Eisenhower administration, facing criticism both at home and abroad, was laboring under the naive thought that U.S. policy in Latin America was sound, but hadn't been sold properly, essentially seeing relations with the region as a PR problem. The thinking was that having Vice President Richard Nixon visit several of America's closest neighbors and advocate on behalf of U.S. policy and capitalism would improve relations. The Vice President asked to have meetings with opposition leaders and students at universities, hoping to engage in a robust debate that would change minds. The tour came at a difficult time in U.S. relationships in the Americas, where the Eisenhower administration was seen as supporting dictatorships, possibly in response to fear of Soviet overtures. The administration was criticizing for favoring military aid over economic support. U.S. policy advisors feared Soviet tactics that would deliberately wreck Central American economies, hoping that communist parties would thrive in the resulting vacuum. In May 1958, CIA Director Alan Dulles described such economic warfare as the most serious challenge this country has ever had to meet in time of peace. The administration was criticized for seeing everything in terms of a Soviet threat and ignoring underlying issues and is siding with repressive regimes in their zeal to oppose communism. Governments throughout the region were on precarious footing. The trip came at a time of a crossroads in U.S. policy where conservatives within the administration, who believed that any development had to come through private sector means, were vying against a more liberal position that economic aid was necessary in order to provide stability. And in addition, there were several outstanding trade disputes in the region. But nowhere were the disagreements more severe than in Venezuela. The eight-year reign of Marcos Perez Jimenez had been overthrown with a coup d'etat in January. The opposition that resulted in his overthrow was purportedly inspired by the words of Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish, quoted at a performance of composer Aaron Copland's orchestral work Lincoln Portrait in Caracas in March 1957. Perez Jimenez's rule had had mixed results. He had engaged in a number of public works, but the economy had ridden a bubble based on oil and borrowing, and the public debt had skyrocketed. Worse, he repressed any opposition with secret police and was elected using questionable means. He was perceived as a dictator, and as he fled to the U.S. after the coup, the Eisenhower administration was associated with him. It was hoped that Nixon's visit would make amends, as the administration wanted to make it clear that they preferred to see popularly based anti-communist governments rather than dictatorships. But it was not clear how Nixon was supposed to accomplish that change in perception. The government was being ruled by a military junta until elections could be held in the fall, but the junta had allied with leftist parties in the coup and was loath to alienate them. The officials at the U.S. Embassy in Caracas expressed their concerns for the vice president's safety and questioned the wisdom of a visit so soon after the coup. The ambassador recommended against Nixon's visit. The State Department gave the junta the opportunity to withdraw the invitation, but the government, perhaps thinking that they had placated the left enough, guaranteed Nixon's safety. The 16-day tour included visits to Uruguay, Argentina, Paraguay, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, and Venezuela. The general thought was that it would be routine and unremarkable, and as the vice president and his wife left on April 28th, the trip received scant attention in the press. The greatest rationale for the visit was Argentina, as the president had been invited to attend the inauguration of Arturo Frondizi, celebrating the return of Argentina to democracy after the Peronist era. It was important that the administration show support in order to help fight the perception that they were too aligned with authoritarian dictators. Eisenhower himself chose not to go because he was planning a trip to Latin America later in the year. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles was sensitive to criticism that he was away too often, so Nixon was seen as the best choice to lead a delegation. Nixon's reception, with a few exceptions, was not as warm as he had hoped. Nixon did receive a great ovation in an Ecuadorian stadium when he bounced a soccer ball off his head, but there were protests from the start, with about 40 students in Montevideo protesting when he arrived, shouting out with Nixon. Trade issues dominated the discussions. The first significant indication of trouble came in Peru, 
The State Department had assumed that Peru would be one of those states most supportive of the tour. But the students at the notoriously independent San Marcos University prevented Nixon from speaking and pelted him with vegetables and vitriol. It was an unexpected level of opposition. Some assert that the government had possibly encouraged opposition, hoping that that would press Nixon on trade and financial aid, but that the protests grew beyond their control. In the end, the visit ended up hurting the Peruvian regime, who appeared to be helpless. But the last country on the tour was Venezuela, and there, despite the promises of the junta to provide security, things went dangerously awry. Astoundingly, the original plan was to have the vice president and his wife ride through Caracas in an open convertible like they had done through the rest of the tour. The junta, apparently overestimating their own popularity, had simply not anticipated violence, even though officials at the U.S. Embassy had. Even getting off the plane with the obligatory playing of national anthems was marred by opposition, and banners reading Yankee Go Home and Imperialist Dogs were unfurled the moment Nixon hit the staircase. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Manny Chavez, the air attaché to the embassy, expressed amazement that they weren't getting into the cars on the tarmac, but walking through the terminal. Clearly, the rest of the trip had not prepared the Nixons for Caracas. Reporters in the airport had already received news that protesters were blocking the motorcade route. There was a large protest inside the terminal, and the military was needed to even push them through to their waiting cars. A mob surrounded them, screaming and spitting. A reporter on the scene said that both Nixons and everyone near them was drenched in spittle from the frenzied mob, and described the Venezuelan soldiers as mostly ornamental. That convinced the party to go in the limousine rather than the convertible, a decision which likely saved their lives. But the vice president only had 12 Secret Service agents with him, and they would be standing off against crowds that were in the thousands. The front car in the five-car motorcade included the vice president and Venezuela foreign minister Oscar Garcia Valentini. The rear car included Mrs. Nixon. The first event scheduled was a wreath-laying ceremony at the grave of Simon Bolivar, considered the father of the country. The motorcade's path took it down the Avenida Sucre in the heart of the workers' district, which had been the scene of the bloodiest riots in Venezuela's numerous revolutions. The area of slums nearby were so violent that they were no-go areas for the police, and generally were filled with supporters from the left. One of the slums was called the Sierra Mestra, named for Castro's guerrilla camp. Large crowds, stirred up by liberal and communist newspapers, came down from the slums and blocked the road. Witnesses said a crowd of two to five hundred surrounded the vice president's car, kicking and battering the car with clubs and rocks. The car was armored with shadowproof windows. U.S. Secret Service agents surrounded the car. One was hit on the head with a shell casing, stumbled, but he got back up and continued protecting the vice president. The agents were trying not to inflame the situation and were pushing back, as the official report reads, with their open palms rather than with fists or weapons. A reporter on the scene described their actions as cool and magnificently executed maneuvers. The local police seemed helpless. The Secret Service report noted dryly that they did not intervene. A reporter saw one local officer try to leave the car with his gun, only to get immediately back in. Another officer was seen to throw a tear gas grenade, but it only distracted the crowd for a moment. Nixon described Foreign Minister Velatini as close to hysterics and said the minister kept repeating, this is terrible, this is terrible. The violence and intimidation went on for 12 minutes. The crowd finally broke the car windows with what was described as a battering ram. Flying glass injured some occupants, including Velatini, who's got glass in his eyes and had to be rushed to a hospital. When the crowd started rocking the car and trying to turn it over and seeking to pull Nixon from the car, the Secret Service agents finally withdrew their guns, prepared to shoot into the crowd. Nixon knew the wrist and ordered them not to shoot without his command. Nixon later wrote, That is a frightening sound, incidentally, the crack of rocks against a closed car. There are several different stories as to how the cars escaped. The Secret Service report says that a flatbed truck used to carry reporters was employed to make a path through the crowd. Although a reporter on the scene described the vice president's car, apparently responding to the injury of Velatini, lurching over a curb and down the sidewalk to get through the roadblock. The reporter noted that the horde just stood there, angry and frustrated, when its quarry got away. Nixon later said, I felt as if I had come as close as anyone could get, and still remain alive. Among those injured by the shattered glass was Rosemary Woods, Nixon's longtime executive assistant. Pathé News at the time described the attack as the most violent attack ever perpetrated on a high U.S. official on foreign soil. There was another violent crowd at the memorial to Bolivar, so the motorcade skipped the wreath-laying ceremony and proceeded directly to the U.S. ambassador's residence, 
There, the ambassador requested military assistance, and the facility was secured by Venezuelan troops, tanks, and armored cars, as well as the U.S. Marine Guards. Upon arriving, Pat Nixon was openly weeping. The crowd at the Shrine to Bolivar, unable to rail at Nixon, tore the wreath that he was supposed to place to shreds. It is unclear as to why the Venezuelan reaction was so tepid. Nixon said that Velatini said that the communists had helped them to overthrow Perez Jimenez, and they were looking for ways to work with them. The police may simply have been afraid for their own lives, but it was clear that the junta was in a precarious position, and they didn't want to offend the left, and that they had their eyes on the upcoming Venezuelan presidential elections that were coming in the fall. The reaction of the Eisenhower administration was swift. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles contacted the junta, demanding that Nixon be protected. Eisenhower mobilized a significant force, including an aircraft carrier, two amphibious assault ships, eight destroyers, and elements of the 2nd Marine Division and the 101st Airborne Division to nearby bases. Nixon was initially upset that he had not been consulted on the troop buildup, but found out that the communications between Caracas and D.C. had been cut for a period of time. While the task force was officially there to cooperate with the Venezuelan government, the implication was clear. Eisenhower was prepared to invade if the vice president suffered further indignity. The junta apparently got the hint because when the Nixons went back to the airport the next day, following the same route they had taken the day before, the route was completely clear. All the roads had been blocked off by soldiers with tanks who were literally holding back the crowds with machetes and tear gas. That is the last image that Venezuelans got of Richard Nixon's goodwill visit. Eisenhower's military response damaged U.S. credibility throughout the region. The Nixons returned to the U.S., where Eisenhower ensured a hero's welcome in Washington, giving federal employees the day off to come and see him return. Nixon and the administration wrote off the violence as being the result of communists, supporting the administration's vision that the troubles in Latin America were the result of Soviet influence. But it was clear that U.S. relations in Latin America were in deep trouble. Nixon was generally appreciated in the U.S. for remaining calm in the face of the crisis, and his popularity soared. While some saw the events in Peru and Venezuela as a disaster, political commentator Walter Lippmann, for example, described it as a diplomatic Pearl Harbor, others saw it as important because it brought issues of U.S. policy in Latin America into focus. And it did change U.S. policy. America became more willing to negotiate, for example, price support for commodities or development funds. It drove a change to the end of the Eisenhower administration and through the next couple of administrations where the U.S. took responsibility for development in Latin America. Unfortunately, the success of those policies is at best ambiguous. To be sure, not everybody in Peru and Venezuela agreed with the protesters, and there was significant condemnation in both countries for the actions of those protesters. All the major political candidates standing in the 1958 general election in Venezuela condemned the protest, except for the leader of the junta, incumbent President Admiral Wolfgang Lerizabal, who threw in his lot with the protesters and proclaimed that he would have protested had he been a student. Lerizabal lost the election to center-left candidate Romula Betancourt, today seen as the father of Venezuelan democracy. One of the greatest effects might have been on the 1960 U.S. presidential election, while Nixon's reputation had been burnished, the protests gave Kennedy an avenue of attack, and Nixon was forced into defending policies that his own visit proved had had disastrous results in relationships with our closest neighbors. One final point that's important to note is what might have been. When Eisenhower was told of the attack on the vice president's motorcade, he said in a cabinet meeting, I'm about ready to put my uniform back on. The force that he mobilized was a significant military force, and it is apparent that Eisenhower was fully prepared to invade Venezuela. Had those protesters succeeded in pulling Nixon from that car, U.S. Marines almost certainly would have been in Venezuela within the week, and history could be quite different. At Nixon's request, all 12 of the Secret Service agents that had been on the mission were given the Decoration for Exceptional Civilian Service. They deserved it, not only for what they faced, but for what they prevented. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.